Is there a supernatural dimension? A world beyond the one we know? Is there life after death? Do angels exist? Can our dreams contain messages from heaven? Can we tap into ancient secrets of the supernatural? Are healing miracles real? Sid Roth has spent over 35 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome, welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. I just love the rarefied air of heaven, the supernatural of God, the presence of God. I have a question for you. Why are the Jewish feasts removed from Christianity? Uh, let me pose it a little different. They're, they are Jewish feasts, but they're not just Jewish feasts. They're biblical feasts. But God says in Leviticus, he calls them my feasts. So they're God's feasts. So why were the Jewish biblical God feasts removed from Christianity? It's a question to ponder. Now, there's only one person that benefits for these being removed if, as you're about ready to find out, they clearly show what is going to happen in the end times in mystery code, just as the first few feasts that are God's feast show the whole first coming of Jesus, the last feast show the return of Jesus. Who benefits by keeping believers ignorant? I have Perry Stone here, and uh, Perry, the last time that I interviewed him, he brought someone with him, his father, who is now in heaven. And his father operated in all nine gifts of the Spirit. And I asked Perry the last time I spoke with him, did your father have a prophetic word just before he died? And you answered? He said, the Lord spoke to him, and this is about uh, a month before he passed, that in the last days, as we come closer to the time of the end, believers were going to come under a lot of stress, a lot of satanic temptation. And he said, some of this will be temptations that people have never dealt with. He said, godly people. He said, some of it will be sexual temptations with thoughts in their mind to do things they've never thought of doing. He said, the only, and he was crying when he told me this. Mm -hmm. And he said, please tell them that the Lord said they have to pray excessively in the Holy Spirit. They have to use the prayer language of the Spirit. And when they're under temptation, don't try to fight it just by, by rebuking it in your nat natural tongue. Fight it by praying heavy in the Spirit of God to get your mind renewed. I, I, that, was the, that was one of the last things I, I have to tell you, Perry. I feel like I don't want to go out in the world unless I've prayed for about an hour in tongues. And I've been doing this now for the last few years, and I've been urging everyone else, but yes. I didn't know that prophetic yeah. word. Okay, Perry has spent 80,000, listen to me, 80,000 hours studying the Word of God. Perry is one of the pioneers of what is known as the Jewish Roots Movement. Perry comes from, is it three genera four generations? Four generations of people in ministry. He has something that you must understand. Tell me how you first got interested in Israel and even the Jewish roots, because if you come from the background that I think you do, you didn't even hear a lot about the Old Testament. The only thing I heard growing up was Pentecost, because that was the background right. of our group. I didn't know anything about Passover. I didn't know unleavened. I, didn't, I did, probably didn't hear unleavened bread till I was in my 20s. 
And the, the, what triggered me was a trip to Israel, the very first trip I made. And I saw some things that I won't have time to go into detail with, the earthquake fault line on the Mount of Olives, the, the giant birds that were repopulating up in the Bashan area. And I realized this is all in the Bible, but it wasn't right. being reported here. You know, it's kind of like they knew it there, but it wasn't being reported here. So I started going to Israel, and when I would go, I'd take a photographer to take slide pictures, and I would come back to the States and begin to show, I call it update inside of Israel. And I would begin to show the pictures along with the teaching that the Lord had given me. And it just absolutely became the most popular teaching of the whole week. The largest group of people to attend would come. They would bring unsaved people. A lot of people came to know the Lord because they realized what's written in the Bible is happening. Number one, that makes God's Word real. It makes God real. Number two, it means we're coming into the last days. Peace. So, mm -hmm. where does that fit into it? When did your eyes open up to why the feasts in the Bible are so important? It was, pro you know, I started preaching when I was 17. Probably in my 30s, when I really started doing, digging in deep into the Hebraic roots, did I realize that the seven festivals of Israel, the Moedim, the festivals of Israel called the feasts, are convocations of God, but they are appointed seasons. If you look at some of the wording in Hebrew, but also one of the translations in the English Bible will tell you, these are my appointed times. Now, what really got my interest was that Jesus came as the Lamb, but He's coming back as the Lion of Judah. So there's two natures here in one man, the suffering Messiah and the ruling Messiah. Now, those of you maybe you know, watching the program uh, from Israel and you have a rabbi, one of the things the rabbis teach is that there is a Messiah coming, but there's two Messiahs, Messiah, son of Joseph, the suffering Messiah, Messiah, son of David. And they even believe that in Jesus' day. But the thing you have to understand is in the Scripture, He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the end, the first, the last. The first time He came, He came to fulfill Isaiah 53, the suffering Messiah. But the second time He comes back, He comes back as the Son of David to rule on the throne, the Mashiach, uh, the Son of David. And so if we understand that, then we can better understand that the feasts are divided up into three sections. The three spring feasts are fulfilled through Yeshua, through His resurrection, death, burial, etc., His ascent, His uh, His coming, His uh, uh, appearance to the disciples during first fruits. Pentecost was the birth of the what we call the New Testament church, the ecclesia of the called out ones on Pentecost. But we've not yet quite gotten to the three fall feasts yet. The, that's trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. And when I started really studying this, I said, wait a minute. Uh, they're, not, they're, they're not preaching to me or they're not sharing with me that these three fall feasts are all in prophecy and have not yet happened. Why are we not studying this? And that's what triggered me into studying it is to realize three of the fall feasts haven't totally taken place yet. Well, you know, Perry mentioned the word in Leviticus 23, convocation. In the Hebrew, that could be translated rehearsals. Now, if you saw the rehearsals for the first coming of the Messiah and they came out to the decimal point, I mean, it, it's uncanny. It's, it, God is so magnificent how God could do this. Wouldn't you like to know what the last, the fall feasts are all about, which will show you to the decimal point everything you need to know about the return of the Messiah? I'll be right back. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. My passion is for you to walk in divine health 24-7. That's why I handpicked my favorite healing scriptures from many translations of the Bible, personalized them for you, and made them available in this free ebook. I want you to meditate or pray out loud these scriptures over your life daily and witness the supernatural healing power of God's kingdom come upon you. Download your free healing scriptures ebook now. We now return to it's Supernatural. Hello, this is Rod here with Perry Stone. And uh, Perry, many Christians say, I don't know about studying those feasts because my Bible says I'm no longer under the law. What would you say to them? Yeah, you know, we've talked about this before, how that in the Torah, five books of Moses, you know, you have what's called the law of God, ceremonial, sacrificial, and the moral law. The sacrificial law were all the sacrifices, the lambs, the bulls, the rams, the pigeons. That, that is Christ fulfilled the law. He became the final sacrifice. So there's no more sacrifices as far as animals. So that's what the New Testament's talking about. Now, when we talk about the law of God, when it comes to, let's say, the moral law, that's God's character. That's how God wants His people to live. And you have these laws in the Torah 
that are also, by the way, found in the New Testament. I can show you in the New Testament, you don't kill, you honor your father and your mother, you don't commit adultery and fornication. Uh, these, these scriptures that we call the commandments are still, but here's the key. In the New Covenant, they operate off of love, meaning that God says to you, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal, you're not going to commit adultery, you're not going to covet. If you love God with all your heart, you're going to obey those commandments of worshiping God, keeping a Sabbath day to worship Him and so on, not taking His name in vain. So the, the fact is, the New Covenant, the only change we have is we're operating off of love, meaning if we love people and love God, we're going to, uh, we're going to follow His Word. It's going to be an automatic thing because He's changed our heart to follow His commandment and His Word. Now, you have found such amazing nuggets in the only book, hear me, the only Bible the first church had was what we call the Old Testament. And from that Bible, they were functioning really, really well. Uh, but you were talking uh, about the blood moons, mm -hmm. and this gives us an insight into yeah. the timing of what's happening on planet Earth. Well, several, several years ago, in fact, it was in the 1990s, I began to study a verse that's very complicated in the sense of how do you interpret it. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Right. In, 19, uh, in the 1960s, when they had the moon landing, a woman from my dad's church says, that's the pro prophecy fulfillment. The Russians are going to go to the moon. The Americans are going to go to the moon. They're going to kill each other. It's going to be, I don't know if you ever heard that theory. <laughs> no. And I thought, I mean, how are they going to kill each other? When you swing a sword, you have to swing it so slow, slow, the guy can dodge it. Or if you shoot a, I mean, I was just saying to myself, this doesn't make sense. I, what I did, I studied it from a rabbinical perspective. Now, in the rabbinical perspective, lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. A solar eclipse is when the moon looks orange or looks blood. Those are uh, signs. For example, lunar eclipses. Now, here's the thing you got to understand. We're not just making this up. Rabbis have actually traced this down for hundreds of years, and they've noticed that during certain solar eclipses, things follow in the world. For example, earthquakes often follow, famines often follow, or global wars often follow. With Jews, they discovered that when a moon, the moon turns to blood, if it happens on a major feast day, here's the key. It's not just what we call the moon turning into blood or a lunar eclipse. It's when it happens on feast days through history, something significant happens somewhere within 12 months to 48 months to the Jewish people. Uh, you can, you've had, for example, you've had um, a series of uh, lunar eclipses that have happened in the spring feast and the fall feast uh, on specific feast days about seven uh, times throughout history. And every time it relates either to, to the city of Jerusalem, it relates to the time Columbus discovered America, it, it relates to a time, a uh, prophetic time. Really now, significant Very time. significant. And, and, and I, I wanted to write this down to get them exact for those of you that are watching. The, the next ones that are coming up that are on feast days will be the, uh, the first day of Passover, April 15th, 2014. The first day of Tabernacles, April 8th, 2014. And this is a full lunar eclipse. Then the first day of Passover, April 4th, 2015. The first day of Tabernacles, September 28th, 2015. Now, from, again, a rabbinical perspective, and a lot of the Jewish people watching us have rabbis that can verify this, the uh, blood moons are a bad sign for Israel. They're considered an omen of trouble for Israel. Now, you cannot look at these and say what's going to happen because none of us know. I can't do that. But we do know that on feast days, it doesn't matter if it happens, you know, in January or February, but when it falls specifically on a feast day, something significant happens either with the Jewish people or with Israel. And the sad thing is it's not always good. So that is when, when, when the book of Joel and the book of Acts, Joel 2 and Acts 2 says, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord, uh, most scholars interpret the great and terrible day of the Lord as being the days of tribulation. So these are blood moons to happen before the tribulation period. And we're, of course, we're not in the tribulation period yet, of course, according to what I can see, because, uh, you know, prophetically. Well, I, I see this 80,000 hours of research understanding the Hebraic roots. You see, it didn't have to be explained in the New Covenant and in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. It, everyone understood these things. Perry, would you understand where we are prophetically, what's going on prophetically if you had never studied the Hebraic roots? It's totally impossible. Okay, it, hold yeah, that thought. We'll impossible. be right back. <laughs> right back to It's Supernatural. 
Call now and receive Perry Stone's anointed end time course on the seven biblical feasts, which includes his book, The Prophetic Future, Concealed in Israel's Feasts, plus his two DVDs, America and the Fullness of the Gentiles, and Mysterious Events Surrounding the Catching Away of the Saints. Yours for a donation of $40. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9212. In this groundbreaking yet easy to understand prophecy course, you will discover the hidden codes concealed within the seven biblical feasts, which God calls His appointed times. Find out how the rapture of the church is coded within the feasts of trumpets. The seven-year tribulation is foreshadowed in the Day of Atonement, and the second coming of Jesus and His 1,000-year reign is pictured in the Feast of Tabernacles. Learn about the supernatural link between Israel and America. Understand what role America will play in Bible prophecy. Find out how the sounds of the shofar blown on Rosh Hashanah, the biblical Feast of Trumpets, will announce the rapture of the church. Understand the powerful prophetic message revealed by God when you see the tabernacle of Moses overlaid on the map of America. If you understand the patterns of the feast, it totally, completely clarifies all of the confusion in the body of Christ surrounding the timing of the Lord's return as it relates to that time known in the Bible as the Great Tribulation. Every believer should begin studying the seven prophetic feasts of Israel. Don't miss out on getting Perry Stone's anointed end time course on the seven biblical feasts, which includes his book, The Prophetic Future Concealed in Israel's Feasts, plus his two DVD set, America and the Fullness of the Gentiles, and the mysterious events surrounding the catching away of the saints. Yours for a donation of $40. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9212. Call or you can send your check to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural, P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify offer number 9212 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today. We now return to It's Supernatural. Now, we found that these feast days that are called God's feasts, are virtually ignored by the church, but they're not ignored by the devil. He picks feast days to attack Israel. Explain, Perry Stone. If you go into the New Testament, um, and you know, this is some research that we did, I found it very intriguing that, for example, when Satan would come after Jesus, he would usually come after him with a large crowd of people who didn't like him on Passover in Jerusalem. <laughs> He, in the book of Acts, for example, during Passover, who was beheaded? James was beheaded, and Peter was going to be beheaded after Passover. So then you had one apostle being killed before Passover, another one being attempted to be killed right after Passover. And I start realizing when you look at the, the New Testament up into the book of Acts, there's probably six to eight examples where you can show you where the worst attack to come against Christ or against the apostles happened during the time of the feast. Now, I believe there's several reasons for that. Number one, Jerusalem was the site of redemption. And I'm going to give you a nugget here that's very powerful that the Lord gave me, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper, saw it yesterday. The reason Satan wants Jerusalem is he wants to own the site of redemption. Hmm. He wants to own the land where redemption took place and lay hold of it and claim it for himself. And he's not going to be able to do that, but he's going to make an attempt to. And if you will discover, uh, if you will look at these times when he would attack Christ during feast days, it was usually around Jerusalem or it was a time of a feast because, number one, it would be the site of redemption and was the site of redemption in the book of Acts. Number two, the largest crowds of people were there, which meant that if the Pharisees wanted to start a rumor on Christ, they had more people that could spread the rumor mm -hmm. than they had any other time during a feast day. So when you look at this, you come to the conclusion after you study these examples in detail, which I have, that the enemy understands the feast days. Why did Israel get attacked during Yom Kippur years ago? The Yom Kippur War, when the Syrians came in to attack Israel, was during the time when all the Jewish men were on a fast and they were in the synagogue. Right. Why, why Yom Kippur? So in other words, we have to understand that if Satan sees these feasts as significant, Surely we better understand what they represent. Well, not only understand what they represent, because God says these are my feasts. And in the Hebrew, the word for feast is these are my appointments. And many have found that when you worship God on his feast, there's like a 
portal, uh, an amazing portal to heaven where the glory of God can come upon you and the angels can come up and down mm -hmm. uh, the ladder. I mean, the devil knows why he attacks yes, us, but Christians must know right. why not you have to. You don't have to come into the presence of God. You get to. That's right. You see the difference? Tell me a little bit about what you've gleaned on the second coming from the feast. Well, one of the things that I love to do, first of all, is to show people that in the seven feasts, there were three that all men had to attend. Passover, Pentecost, and mm -hmm. Tabernacles. Now, watch how significant this is. Passover, the emphasis there is the blood of the Lamb. That's your redemption. No one can be saved for you. You have to present yourself to the Lord for your salvation. Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, and that's the Holy Spirit baptism. So when you are to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, nobody can come on your behalf. You have to present yourself to the Lord. The third is tabernacles, which in the early church was a picture of the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the resurrection of the dead and the reign of the Messiah. Nobody can be resurrected for you. You're going to have to appear before the Lord and be resurrected yourself. Now, how interesting that out of these seven, the Lord chose number one, number four, and number seven, each representing something you have to personally do to enjoy the pattern of that celebration. Salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and the rule and reign of Christ through a resurrected body. And you have to be there. No one can do it for you. You must appear before the Lord, and it's you and Him alone during those three. What about what's known as the millennium? Yeah. Uh, give me a little insight in that. Well, if you remember at the Mount of Transfiguration, you had Christ and you had Moses and Elijah, and they were transfigured before the disciples. You know, Peter was so excited, and this, this, uh, this appears to have fallen during the Feast of Tabernacles because Peter said, let us build three tabernacles, but actually it's let us build three booths. And, you know, tabernacles is when the Jews build a, build a booth out of different uh, leaves right. and, you know, things, and they live outside. So this, because of what Peter said about let us build three tabernacles or three booths, uh, that transfiguration is a picture of the kingdom which is coming in the future. So in the millennial reign, what happens is this. You know, tabernacles is the one feast that Jews and Gentiles both come together. Even in Israel, it's a huge celebration. They celebrate together almost like one family. And so the, here's the pattern. Jesus is crucified at Passover in the grave, in the, in the tomb at unleavened bread, seen alive, at, alive by His disciples at first fruits. Then the church is born on Pentecost. And we are still, if I can say this, we are still prophetically living at Pentecost. We're living in the church age. We're living in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit right now. But we're coming to trumpets. Trumpets is a picture of the gather, catching away, the gathering together of the saints, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Following the catching away, there comes the tribulation, which is the day of atonement, because atonement follows trumpets 10 days later, and it's the time when Israel was judged by the Lord. Either mm -hmm. they were released or they were judged, depending on their spiritual condition. But after the tribulation ends, we come to the millennial reign in Revelation chapter 20, and the millennial reign of Christ is a thousand-year reign, and that's pictured by Feast of Tabernacles uh, when we're, we're with Him. And really, Tabernacles, as you know, Sid, is the seasons of our joy and seasons of rejoicing. It's the last feast to introduce the rain, praying for the coming harvest, praying for the rain season to come. The Feast of our joy. Absolutely. I it mean, was a how would you time. like to celebrate an appointment with God with supernatural joy? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you know? Well, one of the things that I find is amazing is many Muslims mm -hmm. are having dreams and visions of God. And you said we're at Pentecost right now, which talks about dreams and Absolutely. visions of God. And, and I will confer that to you. We have been contacted by individuals who have been Muslims who simply got hunger for God, got hungry to say there must be something more. And the odd thing is, if you're a Muslim and you're watching, God will visit you, Jesus will visit you in a dream. It's happened by the thousands. And see, it's happening more and more. We get emails constantly from Persians and Iraqis and people in Egypt, and all they do is pray. And they say, Lord, if you're real, show me. And the amazing thing is, I'm telling you, he, G. Christ is appearing to them, literally appearing to them and telling them who He is. But not just Muslims, but Jews. Yes. Orthodox Jews are having dreams and visions. But Perry, can you picture the training an Orthodox Jewish rabbi has, then has the revelation of what <laughs> the old revelation of, rather than two messiahs, Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David, one Messiah, two appearances, and then becomes a oh. teacher? But, but let me ask you this. I want you to ponder this. The Jewish person that has crossed your path is not an accident. 
You are to love that Jewish person to Jesus. Jews and Muslims, one in Messiah, one in Yeshua. The prayer right now is, God, show me the truth about Jesus. I want to experience your presence. Pray that. Because the day that yes. you seek him with all of your heart, in that day, I promise you, he God. will be found God. right now. Don't even wait till we go off the air. Right now, say, show me the truth. If you know God, you have everything. If you have everything and don't know God, you've got nothing. Did you know that the return of Jesus and the reign of God's kingdom on earth will occur someday soon on the three biblical fall feasts? At the rapture, it is a gold trumpet that literally is God's trumpet. Only someone like Perry Stone, who understands Israel, the Jewish roots, and studied the Bible for over 80,000 hours and has a supernatural gift of teaching, can help you unlock the significance of the seven biblical feasts and help prepare you for the end time events about to occur on planet Earth. Call now and receive Perry Stone's anointed end time course on the seven biblical feasts, which includes his book, The Prophetic Future, Concealed in Israel's Feasts, plus his two DVDs, America and the Fullness of the Gentiles, and Mysterious Events Surrounding the Catching Away of the Saints. Yours for a donation of $40. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9212. If you understand the patterns of the feast, it totally, completely clarifies all of the confusion in the body of Christ surrounding the timing of the Lord's return as it relates to that time known in the Bible as the Great Tribulation. Every believer should begin studying the seven prophetic feasts of Israel. In this groundbreaking yet easy to understand prophecy course, you will discover the hidden codes concealed within the seven biblical feasts, which God calls His appointed times. Learn how the fall feasts reveal future events about to take place on planet Earth. Find out how the rapture of the church is coded within the feasts of trumpets. The seven year tribulation is foreshadowed in the day of atonement and the second coming of Jesus and His 1000 year reign is pictured in the feast of tabernacles. Learn about the supernatural link between Israel and America. Find out that Christopher Columbus was of Jewish heritage and discovered America on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Understand what role America will play in Bible prophecy. Find out how the sounds of the shofar blown on Rosh Hashanah, the biblical Feast of Trumpets, will announce the rapture of the church. Understand the powerful prophetic message revealed by God when you see the Tabernacle of Moses overlaid on the map of America. The first coming of Jesus the Jewish people understood the biblical feasts, but they didn't understand the key, Jesus. Mm -hmm. At the return of Jesus, Christians understand Jesus, but they don't understand the biblical feasts, which is the key to understand His return. Don't miss out on getting Perry Stone's anointed end time course on the seven biblical feasts, which includes his book, The Prophetic Future Concealed in Israel's Feasts, plus his two DVD set, America and the Fullness of the Gentiles, and the mysterious events surrounding the catching away of the saints. Yours for a donation of $40. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9212. Call or you can send your check to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural, P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify offer number 9212 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today. Next week on It's Supernatural. My guest opens up shops, but they're very unusual shops. Better than 90% of these non-believers get miracles and healings when they walk into the shop and then they are open to a presentation that there's only one way to know God, and that's through the Jewish rabbi, Jesus. <laughs>